Hello. Um, thanks for being here. I'm from Tikkan Olam Pharma. My name is Sid Taubenfeld. And I'd like to go through a couple of things about Tikkan Olam. First, how I got involved in Tikkan Olam. And secondly, what Tikkan Olam is up to now, one of our studies, which I think will have important implications for the cannabis community, and basically what other research uh, we're doing. Um, I was working as a hedge fund uh, analyst, portfolio manager, and someone called me up and said, you know, are you interested in, in doing a cannabis company, running a cannabis company? And I said, no. I said, you smoke pot, you see, you feel better. What, what am I gonna do to really show any benefit? And said, they said, well, you gotta go to Israel and speak to Dr. Misholem, Ruth Galili, and Tim and Naftali. And so I went, and this is what she showed me in, in, our, in one of her ulcerative colitis studies. After eight weeks of cannabis treatment, and you don't have to be a big radiologist to sort of see this, that one of the patients had a clean colon. And I said, that's interesting, but not all the patients had it. And what else do you have? And then she showed me uh, one of the Crohn studies she did, and she had an 85.7% significant improvement. And this was just 30 patients. But these 30 patients, as Dr. Dorr said, went through the standard of care, and after using the cannabis, 85.7% felt a significant improvement. And that's something, you know, that doesn't, I mean, you don't see those kind of numbers every day, and they're not coincidental. And the final thing that kind of got me, got me interested was the corticosteroids. Now, uh, we had 30 patients, and 26 of them were taking corticosteroids, and after the cannabis treatment, only four. Now, that may be like something you're not interested in or a nice number, but if you look at the side effects of oral corticosteroids used long term, you know, you have vulnerability to infection, diabetes, hypertension. The fact that we could get the patients off oral corticosteroids in the long term, I think, was, and that kind of sealed it, that there's something going on here and there's something worth pursuing. Um, the history of Tikkun Olam, so I decided, obviously, to do it. Uh, the history of Tikkun Olam was in 2002, it was started as a nonprofit company, uh, basically for Holocaust survivors and uh, veterans, for more for PTSD. 2005, we, you know, they got a, a license, the first license from the government of Israel, and in 2012, they started producing uh, cannabis for medical use and dispensing. Even today, uh, one out of every three patients get their cannabis from Tikkun Olam in Israel. Um, now, in the U.S., it's a whole different story. Um, you know, Dr. Mishulam isolated and discovered THC in 1964, and it took till 1981 to get a drug on the market with had some cannabis usage, and then four years later, Marinol, Durabinol, and Sesamet are the two drugs that are on the market for, uh, for use in uh, nausea and vomiting, CINV. And, you know, before I started doing this, I was thinking, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an analyst, and you have two drugs on the market, and everybody's saying this is a billion-dollar industry, yet these two drugs haven't really done that well or really haven't uh, been used. And uh, with further research, I realized that these are synthetic THCs. Um, it's probably less than 10% absorbed with Marinol, and actually the market is, is a lot bigger once we get to the botanical products. Um, 2010, you had Sativex by GW, which is only approved in Europe for spasticity due to multiple sclerosis. It's a 50-50 product, uh, 50 THC, 50 CBD, and before we heard explanation why it's not in the U.S., but I know they're working on uh, for, uh, for pain, and probably they will be filing at some point. Earlier this year, a liquid form of Marinol was approved, and it was approved as Schedule II, and the other Marinol as Schedule III, and you're trying to figure out why, why is this being approved as Schedule II, more severe? And the answer is that did they do likability studies, and apparently they were able to abuse this more, like dumping cigarettes in, whatever it was, so, and basically that's the approval. And finally, we get to Epidiolex, which is a major victory for this industry, as having a botanical product approved by the FDA, and the bigger uh, improvement is that it's Schedule 5, which is the least, uh, which is the least 
uh, severe of all the, of all the uh, different schedules. And Schedule 5 means you could use it off-label, and you could probably get uh, insurance reimbursement. That remains to be seen. And this is just a quick uh, chart of the uh, DEA scheduling of drugs. You know, you have, just like I spoke before, cannabis, the THC is still Schedule 1 for no with heroin, LSD, and MD, MD. Um, at Tikkan Olam, since we, since, we since we launched the medical, uh, since we just the medical uh, dispensary, uh, we, we decided to actually follow the patients and give them questionnaires to figure out what these patients are taking, what diseases they're, they're taking them for, and how it's working. We've got a database of close to 20,000 patients now, and obviously growing every day as we dispense more cannabis. And if you look, 94% of the patients uh, saw improvement in their condition, and 62 reduced medications, which I'll come to a little bit later, which I think is one of the most important things of cannabis is that we, we can reduce toxic medications. <laughs> this is a study we released early in the year. It's a prospective study on, uh, on, on, on cancer patients, um, their usage, and the efficacy of medical cannabis. It's with uh, Lehi bar Leiv, who Schindler, who's our uh, medical director in Israel, Victor Novak, who's our clinical director, and if you need a paper, Raf, um, Dr. Mishulam has to be on the paper, so we have all the guys on this paper. Um, so this is the indications that we found for use in medical cannabis. 60% of the patients are for cancer, symptoms, 24 pain, and as we move down, we see you know, other, different, other diseases. The, 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 we screened 3,845 3, patients, and 2,923 responded to the questionnaire. The, sever, you know, the severity of this is in, uh, in six months, a quarter of the patients died. So our, our that, that what we're working on is probably close to 2,000 patients. And these are the malignancies they had. They had breast, most had breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, pancreatic, all the cancers that are, that are typically found, but the majority were breast and lung. The symptoms, uh, it's an eight on the pain scale. Eight is a very, it's eight out of 10. It's a very severe amount of pain that these patients had. They had sleep problems, you know, they had digestive problems, all the anxiety, depression nausea and vomiting, of course, all the typical symptoms that you would see with cancer patients. And if you see the global assessment after six months, it's pretty amazing that 50.8% felt they had a significant improvement, 34 and 10 in terms of slight and moderate. So we had a 95.5% improvement in patients, however they, they felt it was, but I think it's very important that that's a, that's a big number, and I think we should really keep that in mind going forward. The quality of life before and after, you can see as things moved along, the, the, this, after six months, we had 611 felt their quality of life was good, and uh, 199 very good. And if you've been around cancer patients, these are very significant numbers. And, so this is, these are the symptoms and the change after six months. And you could see the sleep problems, 16% disappeared, and improvement was 70.8. I think uh, sleep has a lot to do with getting better. I think if people are sleeping better, they have a much better chance of improvement. You see uh, anxiety and depression. You know, a lot of people, like 75% felt improvement, um, digestive problems. And, uh, and nausea and vomiting, of course, which is the old and the tried and true uh, reason for cannabis. So here's the adverse event. You could see it's pretty, pretty good. Only 8% has some dizziness, dry mouth, increased appetite. So it's kind of consistent with what we'd expect with cannabis. And in terms of uh, uh, treating cancer pain, it's, it's probably better than any drug that's out there. So, so this is, I think, if, uh, if you want to, the, the important slide in my presentation is this slide. 
And uh, if you could take away, because this is what I think will lead to for us to do more studies and other people out there doing more studies. If you look at the first line, you have uh, people who stop taking opioids. We have 36%, and we're talking about a pain of eight, which is very significant. 36% stop taking their opioids, and 9.9% decrease their dosage. This is something that's about 50% of patients were off the opioids, and I don't have to tell you what's going on today with opioids in terms of addiction, and I'll come back to it a little later. But I think this in itself uh, propels us to start doing some studies in terms of replacing opioids with, with cannabis. Um, if you look at anxiolytics, the, you know, sort of like the, the Valiums of the world, 23.8% stop taking them. Uh, corticosteroids, 20, 31% stop taking corticosteroids. Uh, and obviously, uh, antiemetics and nausea, 67.3%. So these are, and laxatives, because obviously people stop taking opioids, they, they don't need the laxatives because uh, opioids, you know, can cause uh, tremendous uh, issues with, uh, so I think, but, but I think what we should be concentrating is on the opioids and how these patients stop taking the opioids. And I think you'll be hearing from us in the near future in terms of doing studies. A quick discussion of the, uh, of the uh, study, just so you don't think we were, everything was great. Um, well, the treatment was effective. We had to use a heterogeneous population from a few months to 99 years old. 18.8 .8 patients discontinued treatment, so some people, cannabis didn't help. And uh, the other issue was self-reported. And what we need to do, obviously, is to establish a national and international clinical investment program, investigational program to, to prove these results. Back to the opioids, currently the CDC statistics, 150, 15 Americans die every day from opioid overdose. 40% of the patients involve prescription opioids. Uh, and uh, from a financial burden on the, on, on the country, 78.5 billion a year is cost because of the people abusing opioids. Um, at Tikhan Alam, uh, we're, we're going to go further and do many more studies. These, these are the studies that are scheduled to be done. The Crohn's study, um, as Dr. Dorr mentioned, we just released some data in Europe uh, on Crohn's. We had remission. We had quality of life. Um, we're going to do the other data in terms of, uh, in terms of colonoscopy. We did have decrease in colonoscopy in in patients taking cannabis. We also had a little bit of decrease in placebo, so we're gonna to have to work our way through that in terms to understand what, why that was the case. It was eight weeks. I, I suspect if we take it longer to six months, we probably will see a differentiation between, between uh, the, the, the Crohn's patients and the placebo. We're doing an acute migraine headache study we started uh, we're doing agitation and Alzheimer's. We're more than halfway through that study, and the results are looking pretty good. We're going to start an autism study um, very soon. Tourette syndrome, we're doing an orphan drug. And the most important, we have two prospective study papers coming out probably before the end of the year. One is in autism in 188 patients where we, we, these patients were taking cannabis Obviously, the data will be good, otherwise I wouldn't be mentioning it, and I think you guys should keep an eye. I mean, it's the most patients that have ever been reported upon in autism. And we will be doing a fibromyalgia. We have a fibromyalgia paper with 367 patients. So that's in the near term. I think you, it would be very helpful to kind of keep an eye on that. I think all of us are, are in, the, in trying to make, do studies and increase the clinical data because that's the only way things will change. I think if we increase the clinical data, mainstream physicians will start using, will start using cannabis, and I think ultimately the political people will pick up on that, and I think uh, that will be the beginning of a turnaround for the use of cannabis in sick patients. Thank you.
Hi, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, going back to the opiate uh, reduction use, I saw a column that said new medications. What are the new medications that they, they took after reducing their opiate use? Um, I, I don't remember that. Basically, it was simply we, they stayed on opioids. There was no new medication. Uh, the new medication may have been the, the, opio the uh, cannabis, but these patients were taking cannabis specifically, and they stopped their opioids. There were no other medications at all. I see. Thanks. Awesome. Hi. Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay. Um, the question is, uh, in The Scientist, Dr. Meshalam talks about the possibility of cannabis for type 1 diabetes, and I was wondering if that's on your list also. Um, it's, I've seen some animal data out of Hadassah. They showed it to me. I don't think we're ready for that now, but I'm sure down the road either we'll be doing it, someone else will be doing it, but they have what I've seen as to be very good animal data. Thank you. Um, can you speak to any uh, randomized control trials being done with Parkinson's disease? We've done some preliminary studies in Parkinson's. Um, they, they found it to be safe, it's been effective, but we're not in, right now doing any kind of uh, large scale studies, but I know there are other companies doing it, and it would make sense that Parkinson would be, since it's a neuro neurological disease, it would make sense that at some point someone would be doing some studies on that. Two minutes. Hi, are there any studies being done comparing delivery methods of cannabinoids for things like Crohn's disease, such as inhaling it versus putting it in the gut, either um, in a capsule or suppository? I mean, the, we're, we're thinking of that, and I'm sure others are thinking of that. Right now, we're using sublingual. We found that to be, we, we've done PK studies, and we found that to be the best route of administration, bypassing the liver. In terms of oral, you have to get some specialized uh, some specialized drug delivery to avoid metabolism by the liver. I'm sure there are people working on that. Right now, we're very happy with the uh, sublingual use, but at some point, I think we'd have to get a little more sophisticated. And, uh, but right now, it's for, for Crohn's and others, we're doing the sublingual drops. Thank you for your presentation. Um, the 18.8% that dropped out uh, first, I, I don't recall if you gave a dose of THC and CBD. And secondly, um, do you think they dropped out because the treatment was not effective as opposed to adverse effects? I, I think they dropped out because the treatment was not effective. And I, I'm, I'm sort of happy when I see things like that, I, when I see side effects, when I see people dropping out, because ultimately our goal is to get to, to get the THC or the CBD to be a drug. And if you look in, you know, any kind of PDR or anything, every drug has side effects, and it doesn't work in everybody. So I'm quite happy to see it not working in certain people. Thank you. I don't recall. Did you list a dose? No, we didn't list a dose. Hi, Sid. Thank you. Um, are there any studies being done for mental health conditions to avoid the uh, heavy-duty drugs that are being given? We're not in doing those studies, but... Uh, I think ultimately, you know, if we're doing uh, Alzheimer's agitation in terms of reducing agitation, I think uh, it would be quite possible in autism where you're kind of reducing aggressiveness. I think there's a place for that study, but we're not, we're not doing it. Let's have a round of applause, please, for Sid Tubbenfield.